Good afternoon. I'm Mark Updegrove, the director of the LBJ Library. And on behalf of our co-chairman for this event, Anita McBride from American University, I want to welcome you today to the enduring legacies of America's First Ladies. Throughout our nation's history, First Ladies have played an influential role in American politics and in history. They have served alongside of our presidents as political advisors, diplomats, hostesses, and national role models. Today's program is the last in a series of First Ladies Conferences that we've done at all of the Texas Presidential Libraries. First, a year ago today, at the George Bush Library at Texas A&M. Secondly, at the George W. Bush Library on the campus of SMU in March of this year. And now, this last one. We, um, frankly, we stole this idea from American University. Uh, they did the first conference of this sort under the direction of Anita McBride in 2011. And I can't tell you how invaluable Anita McBride has been in establishing this conference. She'll be on our panel today. She served as the chief of staff to Laura Bush during her White House tenure and has gone on to American University to serve in this capacity. Uh, I, it is, I, before we get started, though, I just want to acknowledge a couple of entities that have also been invaluable. American University as a whole has been very supportive of these conferences, as has the White House Historical Association. Without them, we simply wouldn't have been able to do these conferences. Uh, now, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Nancy Davenport, the uh, interim university librarian of American University, who will introduce our first panel. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to also welcome you to the Enduring Legacies of America's First Ladies Conference. I want to thank the leadership at LBJ Library, especially Mark Updegrove and Linda Johnson Robb for hosting us. Today's conference is the latest in the series and examines the highlights and the many contributions made by America's First Ladies. And as Mark said, it is the last of the conferences to be hosted at the presidential libraries in the state of Texas. American University is proud of its role in organizing and implementing these conferences. We are a university dedicated to public service. Our motto is ideas into action and action into service. For almost 100 years, American University has been generating, training, and teaching leaders, public servants, and scholars committed to professions in public service and global activism. And at the university, we believe that the women who have served in the position of First Lady have too often been overlooked, have received too little formal recognition for their many contributions throughout our history actions that have impacted our nation's public policy, our national politics, and our global democracy and diplomacy. We are committed to celebrating the service of extraordinary women like Linda Bird Johnson and the other women who shared, Lady Bird Johnson, I'm sorry, and the other women who shared that unique experience of being a first lady. We deeply value the role they have played in our society and we are proud to help them tell their stories. We thank all the notable historians, former White House staff, and first family members, as well as the First Ladies Lara Bush and Barbara Bush, for sharing with us their expertise, their time, and most especially, their memories. Since our inaugural conference in March of 2011 at American University, the conferences have grown in size and in scope. We are grateful to our partners at the National Archives and the White House Historical Association, and especially to Anita McBride, an executive in residence at American University School of Public Affairs, who conceived of and who directs these conferences. I now invite Alan Lowe to come to the podium and introduce our first set of speakers. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alan Lowe, director of the George W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum, 
It's such a pleasure to join you all here today for what I know is going to be an amazing conference. Thank you all so much for being part of this. My congratulations and thanks go out to all of our conference organizers and supporters, and especially to Anita McBride, uh, to my fellow library director, Mark Updergrove, to our good friends and partners from American University and the White House Historical Association, and of course to the First Ladies Barbara and Laura Bush and all the First Families who have been involved in these conferences, we give you our, our great thanks. This series began, uh, as you've heard, at American University, and then we all agreed it'd be great to bring it uh, on the road down here to Texas, first to Bush 41, and then up to our neighborhood at Bush 43, where we had our conference last March. Uh, now we're glad to be part of this conference here at the wonderful LBJ Library. It may be the final conference in this series in Texas, but I know we all want to continue uh, discussing and examining the vital role that First Ladies play. Now, I am director of the George W. Bush Library, so if you indulge me for just a second, I'd be in big trouble if I didn't say a couple sentences about what we're doing up in Dallas. Uh, we're currently located at a temporary facility just north of Dallas in Louisville, Texas, but we're starting our move down to the beautiful new facility at SMU uh, later this month or early next, uh, and we hope to have our dedication uh, next April. And shortly thereafter, we'll open to the public, and of course, hope you all can come visit us then. Our museum is going to be spectacular. It's very interactive, educational, and we believe very inspiring. Our archives are immense. Uh, we have over 70 million pages just of paper records alone, around 80 terabytes of electronic information, over 40,000 artifacts, and 4 million photographs. So it, it is an, a truly an outstanding, spectacular archives that we have as our foundation there at the Bush Library. And we've also started with a full slate of educational and public programs. So we're not waiting for the building to be complete. We're already out in the community uh, working with schools, with teachers and students all around uh, Texas and the region. We're very proud to be part of the SMU family and of course to be walking, working alongside our partners at the Bush Foundation, the Bush Institute, and of course we're honored to work with President and Mrs. Bush. So thank you for indulging me this for a moment there. We're really proud of the Bush Library and again hope you can come join us in Dallas next spring. Now let me turn to our proceedings today. Our first panel is going to look at First Ladies Through American History and we've assembled some truly excellent participants for you. Uh, first we have Alita Black. Alita is executive director of the FDR Four Freedoms Digital Initiative. It's a web-based education program dedicated to the Four Freedoms. She serves as a professor of history and international affairs at George Washington University and is founding editor and advisory board chair of the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers Project. Alita, it's good to see you again and thank you so much for being here. Next, we have Lisa Caputo. Uh, she's now the Executive Vice President of Marketing and Communications for Travelers. She's held um, leadership positions with Citigroup, Walt Disney Company, and CBS. Uh, Lisa served in the White House as Deputy Assistant to President Bill Clinton and as Press Secretary to First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton. Thank you very much, Lisa, for being part of the panel. And of course, we have Anita McBride. Anita currently is an executive in residence at American University's Center for, for Congressional and Presidential Studies, and also serves as a senior advisor to the George W. Bush Institute. She served in the Bush administration as assistant to the president and chief of staff to First Lady Laura Bush. Prior to that, she had also served in many other capacities at the White House and USIA and the Department of State. And of course, these conferences all flow from her vision and her hard work, and we're deeply grateful to you, Anita. Thank you for being part of this. And then we have Richard Norton Smith. Richard is a tremendous historian, biographer, commentator. He's currently a scholar in residence at George Mason University, but in the past he served as director of the Hoover, Eisenhower, Ford, and Reagan libraries, as well as serving as the director of the Dole Institute and the Abraham Lincoln Library. Richard's been a longtime friend and mentor, and we greatly appreciate his being here today. Thank you, Richard. And finally, we have our moderator, Dee Dee Myers. Dee Dee currently serves as managing director of the Glover Park Group, a public relations firm, and is very active as a political analyst and commentator. She, of course, served as White House press secretary during President Clinton's first term. Dee Dee, it's a great honor to have you here, and thanks so much for taking part with that. I'll turn the proceedings over to you. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you, Alan, uh, and thank you to all of you for being here. It's an honor for me to be here as part of this conference looking at the changing role of First Ladies across history. Um, as we all know, the President's role 
as, as head of state is enumerated in Article II of the Constitution and expanded upon in the Federalist Papers and other places. But there's no equivalent document, historical or otherwise, that really lays out the roles and responsibilities of the First Lady. And so from the moment George Washington put his hand on the Bible to swear the oath of office, that role has been evolving, although the First Lady has continued to serve as the President's spouse, mother of his children, helpmate, confidant, advisor, and all those things. And over time, obviously, that role has changed as each First Lady has had the opportunity to define it and redefine it for herself. Um, but and certainly over, over time, uh, there have been big changes. And Richard, I want to start with you. Um, to be sure, the presidency itself has become so much more complex uh, over two centuries. And so has there been an, in, an equivalent increase in complexity in the role of First Lady? And how has that changed? Well, it's a great question. I think um, in some ways, the, the, the position of First Lady is even more fitted to the contours of the personalities, the preferences, the experiences, uh, the strengths and weaknesses uh, of the occupant than is the presidency uh, in, in, in ways that it, it hasn't changed all that much in 200 years. And Martha Washington presided over not only weekly receptions uh, known as levees every Friday night in New York, but every Thursday she presided over a state dinner. She was, in effect, a political hostess. And for her, just as for Washington, the presidency was an extension in many ways of his executive role during the war, for her it really wasn't all that much of a change. Abigail Adams, on the other hand, who made no secret of the fact that she was not only her husband's partner, but his political partner, uh, was, was mocked in the press as Mrs. President. And in fact, in some ways, the story of, the, of this job over the 200 years is that tension between the purely domestic and, for lack of a better word, the activist. Clearly, in the 20th century, Eleanor Roosevelt and other first ladies have, have tipped it uh, toward the latter. Very quickly, I, I, but I can't come here without tipping my hat to, to a woman who I think, in many ways, is the role model for first, modern first ladies, someone who was both a traditionalist and an activist, who was an active participant in the legislative drama of her husband's presidency, um, and at the same time a symbolic uh, figure to the country, and that, of course, is, is Lady Bird Johnson. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, when Laura Bush was asked during the, the interregnum between the election and the inauguration in 2000, who are your role models? She replied, her mother-in-law, which was politic, uh, <laughs> and, and no doubt sincere, uh, but also Lady Bird Johnson. Yeah. And I, I think probably Lady Bird Johnson is a role model for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. um, well, picking up on that, um, you, both Anita and Lisa, you both worked for First Ladies. Um, did they have role models? Did they look back through history and, and have First Ladies that inspired them or guided them? Uh, Anita? Well, I think that all First Ladies, the answer is yes, of course, but all First Ladies are very conscious of those that have come before them. And we talked about this a little bit uh, today in the, in the teacher session as well, and, and with Linda and with Lisa. You know, you're surrounded by those that have come before you. You look at their portraits every day. You, you recognize that, you know, a lot has happened in this house before you got there. And what will you do with this temporary uh, privileged opportunity that you have to really uh, make a difference. So you, you, you're, they're all very cognizant of those that have come before them, but they also still bring their own interests and their, their own character, their own passions you know, to the role and are able to uh, really support the president in his work, yet still be themselves. What about Hillary Clinton? Well, I think it's very public that um, certainly Hillary Clinton channeled <laughs> Eleanor. <Yeah. laughs> um, um, but, but obviously, uh, she read a great deal about Eleanor Roosevelt and um, it took uh, a, a lot of um, uh, great inspiration from Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, she also uh, would talk a lot about Edith Wilson and how Edith Wilson was, was a real factor in Woodrow Wilson's presidency and, in fact, was, was writing speeches. And then, obviously, Mrs. Kennedy um, uh, played a, a very um, influential role on uh, Mrs. Clinton. They, they spent a great deal of time together before Mrs. Clinton went to the White House. And um, that was really about how do you raise children um, in the White House and protect their privacy, which was something that was incredibly important to both President and Mrs. Clinton. And I, and I know, obviously, to um, uh, President and Mrs. Bush, uh, and I, I think that um, that 
was a very important um, uh, uh, mentor. Mrs. Kennedy was, in, in some respects, a mentor to Mrs. Clinton in terms of how you raise children in the White House, how you protect that zone of privacy, as she would say, um, and allow the children in the White House to lead as normal a life as possible. No problem, right? No problem. Totally normal way to grow up, yeah. right? Um, but um, anyway, so so Alita, the, 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 then that raises, you know, some uh, history as history has marched along, sure. um, the culture has changed, and that has changed our expectations for first ladies. But at the same time, first ladies have often pushed the culture, as I think Absolutely. Eleanor Roosevelt did. How do they do that? Can you talk a little bit about the effect of that? Well, I think one of the things that Eleanor did that nobody could do today. It has nothing to do with skill. It has to do with the culture. I mean, Eleanor was the third most syndicated journalist in the United States. She had her own radio show. She wrote a syndicated newspaper column that appeared six days a week that, that put her on par with Walter Littman and Dorothy Thompson. She held her own press conferences. She was the first first lady to hold a weekly press conferences and courted the press. She also not only courted the press that covered her, but the press that covered her husband. So she had both flanks covered. So she understood, you know, she understood radio, she understood print, but she also understood accessibility. And one of the things I think that also could never happen again today to my great, um, if I could make up a heart, you know, a word, a heart sickness. I mean, I just, Eleanor refused Secret Service protection. And she traveled everywhere unescorted. And she did that because she believed that that would interfere or impede with her conversations with the American public. And so just as today, you know, President Obama has the 10 letters, Eleanor read 150 letters every night and responded to them. So her ability to change culture, not only by, you know, dictating her coverage in the press, but also maintaining huge administration-long personal confidential pen pal correspondence with people that she never met, also traveling around the country unescorted, built a reservoir of goodwill for her that really just elevated her up on a pedestal in her own right. Was she conscious of that at all? Well, to some extent she was. I mean, what um, if I could circle back to a question that, that you guys were answering. I mean, Eleanor went into the White House not wanting to be Ellen Wilson, not wanting to be Edith Wilson, not wanting to be Lou Hoover. And so the issue was, how was she going to find a role that didn't eat her? That's her word. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she has to negotiate with FDR what these roles will be because she makes three offers and he says no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, being the shrewd right. little political operative that she is in her own right, she says, well, let me get my own constituency, honey, and I will show you that I can be good press for you. <laughs> you know, and that's what she does. I mean, Lisa, I think it's also fair to say that Hillary Clinton was on the leading edge of cultural change going on in the country. Yeah. She um, was the first first lady who came with a career, really. Yeah. Uh, she was the first to have an office in the West yep. Wing, for example. Um, how did she change culture, and was she conscious of wanting to try to do it? I don't know that she was conscious of it coming into the role. And, you know, she approached the role of I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do the best job I can and be true to myself. And so so much as we look throughout history, I think the role of first lady um, um, culturally, I think we as a as a country have tried to to create a box and put our first ladies in that box. Oh, they're gonna stand for beautification. Oh, uh, they're gonna stand for say no to drugs. Oh, they're gonna stand for education and and. That certainly wasn't what Hillary Clinton was about. And so, um, you know, she came into this role, um, and we were very upfront about the fact that she was going to play a policy role, that she was going to be um, uh, an advisor to her husband on policy. We were upfront about that. In reality, if you look throughout history, practically all of the first ladies have, have had a role in influencing policy. It just wasn't at the forefront the way Hillary Clinton was. <laughs> on health care, for example, uh, on welfare reform and, and, and other issues um, as it relates to children, women, families. Um, so yes, she was the first first lady to have an office in the West Wing. Um, but she also, as Anita and I were talking earlier to a, to a class, she represented, and I think still to this day in some, in some respects, a, a dialogue that goes on in our country about the role of women, the role of working women, 
Uh, she's a dialogue at every dinner table. D do I want my daughter to grow up um, and have a career and be financially independent and secure and, and maybe not get married? Or do I want my daughter to, to grow up, get married, have a family? Um, or, or is she supposed to be somewhere in the middle and, and have both? And can you do both and do both well? And she represents that dialogue. Certainly, when she came into the role of First Lady, she did. Um, and I think she became a Rorschach test has, that has been reported widely. Um, it's a phrase we've all seen, and, and she kind of represented that dialogue. And I think to this day, as you've seen her transform into Senator, into Secretary of State, um, and what happened in the 2008 campaign, uh, I think still, uh, there's a lot of dialogue um, about the role of women in society, working women in society, uh, that Hillary Clinton represents, certainly um, as it relates to women in corporate America, but also women in government, uh, women who are elected. Um, and, I, and I think that, um, you know, fortunately, we have her to, to be an ambassador for, for women in, uh, who, who work and who have careers, but also have uh, children. Right. Go Can I ask a question of my fellow panelists? <laughs> sure. Uh, no, no, I just, I'm just curious. No, 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 I'm just curious because it's, it's a question that is as old as Abigail Adams. Sarah Polk uh, experienced this. She was also called Mrs. President because she was very much a, a, a partner, political partner with her husband. At what point and how did each of your first ladies deal with the, uh, the question, who elected you anyhow? Mm. Well, see, with Eleanor, well, that came up way before the campaign. Right. I mean, it was, it was a, a 1932 campaign button. The New York Times did full-page stories on her as who was going to be the influence. I mean, even FDR's close advisor said, the first thing we have to do is get the pants off of Eleanor and on to Frank. <laughs> you know, so, so, <laughs> and that was his speechwriter, you know. So, yeah. so, you know, so, so people knew that. I mean, what, what um, you know, um, Eleanor just knew that she was going to be a lightning rod, accepted that responsibility, thought it came with the job description, and said that the nation was in such turmoil mm. that it needed all the leadership it could get. And so she really didn't care, as long as she felt like she brought dignity to the office. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, if I can uh, add to the, thanks for being a moderator for no, us no, today, no. too. I no, 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 this is terrific. But um, in response, you know, uh, to that question, I think it is, it is still a challenge for the, the position, this undefined uh, position. There's no statutory authority. There's, uh, it's what you make it. There's no salary. You're a volunteer. You're the nation's premier volunteer to take this platform, this privilege you've been given, and, and do something with it. But I still think there is a fine line when you go from being policy advocate to a policy maker, mm -hmm. because that's not really your role. And you're not elected uh, to do that. And there is a fine balance. And I think, you know, in, in all fairness, of course, you, you, you saw that in 1993. And, and there was a country wasn't quite ready uh, for that activist role, although they wanted the, um, uh, Mrs. Clinton to use her position, of course. And I, I think, you know, in, if I could just fast forward to one example of, of you know, Laura Bush, and she came in to the White House, you know, she was typecast early by the press. You know, when she was asked, um, you know, who you're gonna be, Hillary Clinton or Barbara Bush, and she said, well, I know Laura Bush pretty well, and I think I'm gonna be her. <laughs> and, um, you know what, because she was, she had a career as a teacher, she had a career as a, a librarian, I mean, this defined her passion in, uh, in education, and she was, a champion and an advocate for No Child Left Behind, which was a signature domestic policy initiative of, uh, for the president. So yes, you know, as, a, as perceived as a more conservative, uh, traditional woman, um, she was extremely comfortable in who she was. And when she went to travel overseas, I'll leave you this last example, particularly in the Middle East, where she took a groundbreaking partnership on breast cancer uh, research and awareness she really believes, and I agree with her, that she was able to go into societies, close societies like Saudi Arabia, and talk about breast cancer with King Abdullah and with women there 
because she was perceived as a conservative woman. So, um, right, so obviously each of their, uh, yeah. uh, sort of their, their, the way they're perceived mm -hmm. affects how, what they can do, right, the scope of what they can do. But each of you has alluded to the fact that either overtly or covertly, these first ladies are influencing their husbands all the time, right? And they're, sure. sometimes they're trying to move him along and sometimes they just have a passion for something. Mm -hmm. Richard, talk about the way, and we seem as a culture to have been more comfortable with the, with the covert mm -hmm. influence, but it's always been there from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. Um, you know, Mrs. Washington burned all of their correspondence, <laughs> and God, what Sad. what we would give, <laughs> yeah, know, you right. know, uh, to 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 have because that. Because she didn't want people to know how much influence she was having. No, because mm -hmm. she, she. I think it was her final act of rebellion mm -hmm. against a world that had intruded on their privacy uh, for forty years. Um, their their love letters. I mean, God, would you know? Can you imagine, do you think George Washington wrote love letters? <laughs> uh, in any event, um, you know, the famous, well, Bess Truman, you know, the famous story, Harry comes downstairs one morning and she's throwing, chucking papers in the, in the fireplace. He said, what are you doing? She said, I'm burning your love letters. And, and he says, my God, think of history. She says, I have, Harry, <laughs> I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, so not only do um, first ladies put their stamp on history, right, but the role of being first lady changes them. Mm -hmm. So, Alita, talk a little bit about, about the changes that you've seen in not just uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, but her, but, but also, sure. you know, certainly um, Lady Bird Johnson didn't come mm -hmm. to public life easily. She did not, that was not, not something she wanted, and yet, as first lady, she became a fierce advocate for her husband and a great, you know, was the first woman to campaign, mm -hmm. first first lady to campaign on her own, mm -hmm. uh, and for and for controversial issues like, like civil rights. And, and I think the, um, you know, they really liked each other. First of all, Eleanor Roosevelt and Lady Bird Johnson, and um, and they both took heroic stands on cultural issues that really changed the landscape of the nation. I mean, no people dealt with race as forthrightly really as um, Eleanor Roosevelt and Lady Bird Johnson. And certainly, um, as much as I would throw my body in front of a train for people that are talked about up here, few people put their lives on the line as much without protection for race as those two. I mean, Eleanor had the largest FBI file in American history. There were assassination attempts on her life for her stance on civil rights, which she came through gradually. Um, one of the most unsung courageous acts, I think, in um, post-war presidency is Lady Bird Johnson's Lady Bird Express. You know, when President Johnson has decided that by God, we will have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he certainly knew that it was the death knell for the Democratic Party in the South. And he, and Lady Bird knew how to sell it. Mm -hmm. And you know, with her grace and charm and conviction, you know, she says, no Southern man is going to stand up the First Lady, so put me on a train, mm -hmm. you know? And she takes the train that basically follows the train that the Freedom Riders took. And there is dynamite on that train tracks, and she knew it. Did they stop the train? No, she kept going. And so every time I think that people don't vote, I go furious not just for the whole intellectual civic freedoms reasons, but I think they spit on those two women's graves. Mm -hmm. And Lady Bird Johnson really needs credit for that because we would not have gotten critical votes to pass that bill if she had not done her work on that train. And your mama had guts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, s s turning to, to, to current politics, um, someday one hopes, right, we will have a first man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, how will the different gender change the role of first spouse, first companion, first advisor? Richard, have you thought mm -hmm. about this? You know, first of all, I don't think it will be, I think the media will go wild. Yeah. <laughs> My God, it's the perfect 24-7 news cycle, cable TV. <laughs> God, just think of it. You know, they can speculate for months and then they can overanalyze for months after it happens. And meanwhile, <laughs> history will roll along right. and we will all adapt. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, think of Dennis Thatcher in Great Britain. In a curious way, 
it might actually be a throwback. We started talking about Martha Washington. The, the, the first lady was originally envisioned um, 200 years ago as someone who, above all, was there to provide support, emotional and otherwise, for, for her spouse. Um, it might very well be that the first gentleman uh, is in a similar role. Um, he had, may very have, have a career of his own. Um, well, I guess what we'll be talking about independent men uh, then. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Um, maybe. <laughs> Um, he, he probably won't have to host a weekly uh, reception. Um, and I think there are a lot of first ladies who would envy him that. But you know what? I think we'll, we'll all adapt just As fine. Um, but you said it's, it's the expectation that the first first man will have a work outside the White House. Would it be possible for a first lady to work outside the White House, as Jill Biden yeah. has done as, yeah. as the spouse of the vice president? Right. What do you think? Yeah, I think, I think that anything is possible. I, again, I believe the institution of the presidency will adapt um, to whatever is happening at the, at the country at, at the time. It just sort of, you know, knowing the position and watching it and the bird's eye view that I had of it of several first ladies, the demands are so much greater than people really realize and the schedule is so intense. And you could go from planning a state dinner one minute to planning a secret mission to Kabul the next, which you know Laura Bush did three times. And so it would be a little difficult, I think, to have work outside the home that was full-time work yeah. outside the home, um, because I think we've also all come to this expectation that this position, the president's you know, partner, uh, whether it's male or, or female, um, does something with the platform that they have in service to the nation. Uh, so that, that, that so it's really become kind of a two-person job. Well, um, two for the price of one, which yeah. became a very <laughs> famous line, uh, so certainly. Right. Um, but, but I think w one of the things I keep hearing and I, and I think is becoming a mm -hmm. very consistent thread is because this role is not elected and because it mm -hmm. is a platform and because it's ill-defined, these, these women who have been in these roles, each and every one of them, has to have a tenacity, a perseverance mm -hmm. um, to define it as she sees fit in a way that's going to help the country and help her husband. Um, and, and I think when you look at Hillary Clinton as a case study, certainly, she, she, she has grown um, not only um, from being First Lady of Arkansas, but she grew in her tenure as First Lady from day one until the day she was elected to the Senate. She grew as a senator and now um, you know, will likely leave the office of, of Secretary of State with probably her, her highest uh, job approval ever, which to me is just fascinating because it is who she is. She is a workhorse, not a show horse. But what was I would like to have everybody harken back to is her uh, popularity would escalate when she was first lady, mm -hmm. when she was portrayed as a victim. Mm -hmm. Juxtapose that to today, mm -hmm. where, where she, her popularity is, is higher than ever because of her job performance in her own right. So we've evolved, yeah. as, as has she. And I think for the first time, the country is really seeing who she really is um, uh, as a person. Uh, and as as the workhorse that she is. But doesn't that, Lita, doesn't that speak to a tension between how we view women's roles? Well, I think America's changing. I mean, just like our electorate is changing, our cultural expectations of what the presidency is and, and our responsibilities to one another changing. And, um, you know, and the presidency is such an extraordinary office. I'm just not talking about a position. I mean, a president needs, you know, a top flight chiefs of staff. God knows they need top of the line press officials. You need people also who can say to you without fear of being fired, honey, you cannot do this. Do, mm -hmm. Don't, you know, you got to sit back, take a breath and look at it. And I think as our relationships as couples and as friends change, that overshadows some the presidency. Because if you look at the presidential marriage, you know, regardless of what people say, gay, straight, black, white, you know, wherever you live in the country, it's about a relationship. And your, rela your personal relationships 
are going to color how you see that. And I think our, our, our country has moved so forward with, you know, um, wanting to be Leave it to Beaver and loving the Leave it to Beaver values, but realizing that times have changed and that struggles involved, we understand that tension. And so I, I am optimistic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Alita just referred to the relationships of the people of, of, of the American electorate. Yeah. But what about the relationships of the first couples? And how has that shaped uh, the role of first ladies over time? Well, that's a great yeah, question a great because question. of all the undefined, unspecified uh, roles assumed by a first lady, um, I mean, every marriage is unique, <laughs> obviously. But one of the things that first ladies, successful first ladies do, is to compensate for their husband's weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, I've always thought Nancy Reagan, frankly, didn't get the credit. Mm -hmm. And I think as time passes and we have more access to papers and the like, I think we'll, be, we'll realize more and more just how significant a role behind the scenes mm -hmm. she played, for example, in, in personnel decisions. Um, she, her husband was a man who uh, was without guile, and who tended to think the best of everyone. And we want our presidents to be like that. On the other hand, that can sometimes be a weakness in a president, and it puts the first lady in the difficult but necessary position of compensating. And we don't have to name names, Donald Reagan comes to mind. Um, <laughs> of, of, of people where, quite frankly, her judgment yes. was superior to that of her husband. Um, Mrs. Ford, you know, uh, was very proud of the fact that she used pillow talk to get a, a woman into the cabinet. Um, and if there had been a second term, I think she would have gotten a woman on the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. But I, I think th this, this um, out of the textbook mm -hmm. history um, goes to the heart of, of your point about relationships, and it humanizes mm -hmm. the White House as nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, so each of you, what quality did your first lady um, I don't want to say compensate for, but compliment her husband. Well, there is such a um, s strong um, soft softness to uh, certainly to Laura Bush that was, you know, these were incredible partners. I feel so strange saying this in <laughs> yeah. front of these two girls who know their parents better than you know any of us, or certainly I can opine. But it was. It's a beautiful, strong marriage, and they have uh, done you know everything together from three months after they met each other, obviously, and knew that they were partners for life, and have and, and to this day, even in the in the post White House life, still supporting this incredible work that they felt privileged to do on behalf of the American people, and are continuing. So I think, Richard, you want to add to no, that? No, I was just thinking, you know, uh, that it just comes to mind that uh, after 9-11, yeah. each, each in their own way. I mean, the Absolutely. president in many ways ministered right, to the country's to the needs, and Mrs. And Bush mothered. Too. That's right. Uh, in the best sense of the word. Right. A country that was particularly her children. Fragile. Who the, were terrified. That's right. Country was fragile, and here she took who she was as, you know, as a teacher, as a, as a mother, and wrapped her arms around the nation and spoke to parents. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, first and said, turn off the TV and protect your children. Let them know they're safe. And I think the nation needed to hear that, and that was part of the healing process. While the president now is faced with the greatest challenge to this country in history, an attack on the nation, and faced with the terrible and difficult decisions to protect the American people. And she was doing that, too. How did uh, Hillary Clinton compliment... I uh, you know, I think that that um, if you're around both Clintons, you can you can see they can the the simpatico there is is incredible. It's um, infectious because they can finish each other's sentences. They see the world the same, and they they desperately want to make the world a better place. And I think you know former President Clinton. Um, He'll be in a room like this, and he will want to meet every single individual in the room, and he'll want to hear what every individual says. And Hillary Clinton um, is very methodical and very analytical. And, and, and in a very interesting way, that's such a strong compliment in the way they, they integrate um, with, with one another. And I think, um, you know, certainly during his presidency, obviously, um, she was 
a, a strong voice on policy, but what she became was a goodwill ambassador globally for women, um, f for the president, um, and, and really transformed that agenda for the Clinton administration um, in a way that I think um, is quite historic. And um, she became almost the mother figure for the world for women, for women's rights um, as human rights and for advocacy for young girls. If you educate young girls, you lift a village out of poverty. So um, again, I think that these first ladies um, in their own way um, become that embracer of either the country or the world on particular issues um, that there's a demand for either domestically or globally. Yeah. Um, you know, and you, you mentioned um, Hillary Clinton's advocacy on behalf of women and girls around the world, but each first lady develops her own portfolio of causes. Um, and how does that come together, Richard? Is that part personality, part agenda of the president? Uh, what are the factors? It's often like so much about the job, it's, uh, it's circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's a reaction to circumstances. Uh, Betty Ford certainly never envisioned herself uh, as an advocate on breast cancer mm -hmm. until it happened to her. And, and even then, uh, it was, she was still in the hospital. She, she turned on the radio and she heard reports that uh, about literally thousands and thousands of women who were going to get mammograms. And it struck her for the first time, I think, the impact mm -hmm. that a first lady can have. Mm -hmm. um, when she was so open about it. Right. She was. There was, that was. That was characteristic of her and of the Ford family. I mean, hopefully when Steve's up here a little bit later, he might talk about that because it was very much a family <laughs> decision. There was nothing that said they had to go public with this. But there was never any doubt uh, about their doing so. Mm -hmm. and, and just think of the reverberating, you know, the, the proverbial ripples in a pond. Uh, to this day, the impact that that one surgical procedure has had. Mm. And, and what about for Eleanor Roosevelt? Well, I think there, um, there are two things, but I'd like to dovetail something about Betty Ford, if I could. I think one of the things that, that when we think about Betty Ford and breast cancer, we just think about Betty Ford and her impact on women. You should read the letters that men wrote her. Mm. You should go to the Ford Library and read these letters from men who finally could go to their wives and their mothers and their sisters, you know, and their neighborhood friends and go with them and the lives that it saved. That to me was more telling really than the letters that, that she got from women. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I would like to say about Mrs. Ford that I don't think has really been um, explored in a way that gives her the courage that she deserves is the Nixon pardon, mm -hmm. which is a whole nother conversation, but she played a major role in that and, you know, will admit that, in fact, she did that. And when she took the oath of, when President Ford took the oath of office, you know, he held the Bible and Mrs. Ford repeated the oath of office with them and put her name in. And when I asked your mom about that, she said, you know, certainly I'm not the president, but we came in in a horrific time in our country's history, and I'm a citizen too, and I have a patri you know, I'm a patriot, and I have my own obligations. And so that's what I hope the, the country can really realize about the men and women that are in this position, regardless of what you know, political affiliation you hold. Mm -hmm. But to go back to Eleanor, you know, she was so stereotyped as FDR's eyes and ears. But um, there's much more to it than that. Um, um, FDR was very gregarious and, God, he just loved being president. He'd just say, I love it, I love it. You know? <laughs> and, and what he loved was, you know, um, uh, the politics of it. And what she brought to him um, in a very political way was the human side of the policy, not in a way that was the feel-good, do-good, bleeding-heart liberal stuff. You know, but how can we make this happen? This is the knowledge that I'm getting. And the second thing that she brought to him um, was the ability to make him face issues that he did not want to confront. And so she would have meetings in her apartment in New York with policymakers and advocates for a specific policy and put it in his bedside table so he couldn't get away from it. You know, so there, so, so, so there were things like that. Um, 
first ladies, so I think that's probably pretty typical though, right? Sometimes first ladies make their husbands confront things or think about things mm -hmm. in different ways. Um, Richard, are there examples of that from um, your studies of first ladies? Or uh, we were talking earlier about how uh, Betty Ford helped shape President Ford's attitudes about women, for example. Well, yeah, um, you know, she had some help. He, he, he had spent a lifetime around very strong women. Mm -hmm. His, he was the product of a broken home. Uh, his mother very courageously left an abusive father uh, with an infant in her arms, left and moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, so he was very comfortable with the idea of strong women. But I do think Mrs. Ford had a significant impact uh, on his views of the International Year of the Woman. Mm -hmm. uh, took place during the, during the Ford presidency. And I think as they got older, Gerald Ford, unlike most of us, we, we tend to get more conservative. Um, he did the opposite on a number of issues. Um, in fact, he said to someone about 10 years before he died, that people had better get used to the idea of gay marriage mm -hmm. mm. because it was coming and one day it would be taken, taken for granted. Um, but on the issue obviously of abortion, um, they were quite outspoken, uh, pro-choice, and they were marooned in a party that was increasingly hostile to that position and he remained a good Republican, but, uh, but someone who, uh, who believed very strongly that individual rights entailed individual choices, and that that was certainly one of them. Mm. Will history reveal anything that you'd like to reveal now where Laura Bush <laughs> changed oh George Bush's mind? Now, now I get to say that with Laura Bush right here. <laughs> Maybe you can come up here and answer that question. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> we'll get to that later. Yeah. Yeah. Any it's places where Hillary Clinton changed Bill Clinton's mind? Um, Gee, Dee Dee, maybe you could answer that question. I, I um, uh, changed his mind. Um, it's easier when they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> no, not with the family still alive. <laughs> I actually think that works both ways. Right? This is where he changed her mind, so I ought to take the fifth, as we say, as a press secretary. Oh yes, there were, and, and there remain to this day. <laughs> Well done. well done. Well done. Now, um, wait, wait, can I just say one yes. thing? Yes. Um, to to respond to um, Anita's point, um, I think that what history will show when they look at you, Mrs. Bush, mm -hmm. is just an unfathomable impact mm -hmm. that you've had not only with Afghan women, but with PEPFAR. Mm -hmm. You have saved more lives and transformed more healthcare systems than people want to take the time to understand. And I hope you get the credit. And, and, and that's a great segue. I mean, um, Mrs. Bush's work on behalf of women's rights around the world continues uh, mm -hmm. through the library. Mm -hmm. um, how has, it, you know, eight years is or four years is, is not a particularly long time in a lifetime. And so obviously first ladies go on to do many things afterwards. How have the opportunities for first ladies uh, to serve the country after they've served in the White House expanded and changed? Richard? Well, <laughs> uh, that's where I think Mrs. Ford really stands out. I mean, arguably, um, I think she would probably agree that her greatest impact really came yeah, after yeah. she left uh, the White House. Uh, and above all, uh, in her, uh, the work with the Betty Ford Center. Um, there's a wonderful story. She was coming down to, the, she and the president, right after the inauguration, after the Carter inauguration, uh, he had accepted an invitation to speak at a dinner honoring um, uh, Vince Lombardi. And he was feeling kind of sorry for himself, you know, post-electoral funk, um, and wondering whether they would really, you know, they had expected to be hearing from a president. Now they were going to be hearing from an ex-president. Going on and on and on, you know. 
And classic Betty Ford, cut right to the chase. She said, she leaned over and she took his hand and said, don't worry, dear, they're coming to see me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> And in a lot of ways, he was, he, he was very proud of that fact. Yeah. She got the gold medal. She got the Medal of Freedom mm -hmm. before he did. And, she, and he was thrilled. Mm -hmm. and, and every year at the alumni event at the Betty Ford Center, you could find him cooking hot dogs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he was a soldier in the ranks. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was, almost, it was almost as if on a very personal level, it was a reversal of roles. All those years when he was out on the road and she was raising the family, I think there's a certain degree of guilt. And this <laughs> was his back. opportunity to pay back. Yeah. 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 And certainly Eleanor Roosevelt's greatest impact was in oh, the years after. Mm -hmm. afterwards. I mean, with, with her work with building the United Nations, helping shepherd the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, trying to work on the covenant for civil and economic rights, uh, you know, in that major diplomatic institution. But also, she had a profound impact in different ways. She not only lent her name, but her very active presence to major or social change organizations. I mean, she worked very closely with the NAACP. She worked very closely with the National Consumers League. She, was, um, she mentored young people. And that, to me, um, I think, is really a testament to her tenacity. Because this is a woman like all, like all the women that we've talked about, but especially, I think, Mrs. Bush and, and Secretary Clinton, was that they saw the worst the world had to offer. I mean, they saw beyond feast, famine, war, and pestilence, they saw unimaginable horror. And had the opportunity to continue. And they could have given in to it or said, by God, I'm not going to take it. And that's what I think Eleanor's great strength was, was at the end of the war, seeing all the damage that the war had done to the United States, and, but also going to the camps, going to the dislocation centers, really seeing on a very personal way, going into battlefields, flying in uninsulated military aircraft where she lost the hearing in one ear. Mm. I mean, she, she saw it. And you know they could have given in to it, and said, I can do fluff, you know, and cover myself, or by God, it's my country, it's my values, and I'm going to give it all I got. Mm -hmm. right. you know, and they all did that. That's, that's so true, what you, what you say it just resonates with me. We, when uh, uh, Secretary Clinton was First Lady, and the global travel that we did, we, we would go all over the world, and we really became almost a moving public works infrastructure organization because we would come in, and all of a sudden, places would be transformed. Absolutely. Roads would be paved. <laughs> there would be infrastructure, and it wouldn't stop. Like, we would stay on it afterward to ensure that this would continue. So yes, it was about. Um, women's rights and poverty and famine, but it was also the fundamentals of infrastructure Absolutely. that were completely non-existent in so many places in the world where we traveled. I'd like to add one point to that because it does remind me of a lot of the, the travels that got to do together with Mrs. Uh, Bush. And, and, and she would always say, which has always really struck me, was part of it was to go, of course, and shine a light on the, on the work that's being done to help people that need our help because our leadership around the world is so important and is required to make change. But it also was important to bring the message back yeah. to the American people of what their generosity through their tax, you know, hard earned tax dollars, but also their generosity, our compassion as a nation, that we, she was able to help bring that message back home. And that was so important. And that's where we really relied you know, on the media and the press uh, to, to cover these trips um, so that we can bring that message As home. As a trusted translator of what they saw to the Absolutely. American people. Um, you just all talked about sort of the impact of seeing what's happening around the world on the First Ladies and their agendas. What does the what as, as they travel? How are they perceived? How I mean, over the course of the last you know several many decades, um, certainly Eleanor Roosevelt traveled around the world. And what what did that mean to people in developing countries and other places in the world? Well, I'm certainly going to leave um, Secretary Clinton to Lisa, and um, 
But I have to tell you, when I really, I got what Eleanor meant when I was in the favelas in Sao Paulo. If you haven't been in the favelas of Sao Paulo, it's seven million people. They've been revitalized somewhat. But when I was there 10 years ago, well, when she sent me there, um, the sewage was over my ankles, mm. you know, to walk through. And I was talking with women and children about housing in my, you know, 60 words of bastardized Portuguese. And one woman asked me why I was there. You know, and I just thought, you know, forget the policy stuff, forget the stuff. And I just looked at her and I said, well, you know, I work on Eleanor Roosevelt, and she would haunt me for the rest of my life <laughs> if I didn't come. And this woman, who still had a stain on her thumb from voting in a Catholic country, could not, had never heard of Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. had never heard of Princess Diana, didn't know Nelson Mandela, but knew Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm, and knew Eleanor Roosevelt would do three things, wages for work, Mm. school for her children, and a safe place to live. Mm. And I would say that's a kick-ass legacy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Lisa, you have a pretty big piece to bite off, but what, what do you think? Well, now, you? now you know why Hillary Clinton channeled Eleanor. <laughs> <laughs> she takes her to the next level. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think that um, it's fair to say that, that that's a legacy that's been an inspiration to the present Secretary of State. And you know, f for me to, to travel the way uh, Anita did with Mrs. Bush to all parts of the world, um, it was incredible for me to see whether we were in rural parts of Japan, women lining streets, trying to get a glimpse, going to Beijing for um, uh, the World Conference on Women, which was interesting, um, where uh, Hillary Clinton gave the speech, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights, which was a very bold thing to do um, in, in a country, obviously, that's got issues um, uh, with women's rights. And the, I can remember going up escalators in the hotel and women, thousands of them in lobbies trying to touch her you know, on staircases. And what, what a, um, a, a rock star really she was because she embodied hope to them. Mm -hmm. And when we would go to different parts of the world and we would have um, either breakfasts or, or lunches, small, very small, with um, uh, influential women in the community, um, whether we were in Bangladesh um, or in a remote part of India, which I remember quite vividly, where uh, Ila Bhatt, who uh, founded SEWA, Self-Employed Women's Association, women trekked 13 hours, mm. 13 hours to come to a small community meeting with Hillary Clinton and Ila Bhatt. Mm. Now, I, I'd never mm. experienced anything like that before. Or you take it to um, a cosmopolitan city like Tokyo where we would meet with a member of the parliament, um, women, uh, women who may have owned a television station, um, and you'd hear their perspectives and their struggles as women in their own cultures and how they would look to her for advice and counsel and inspiration. And I think she has carried that mantle um, through her tenure as First Lady, obviously into the Senate and now as Secretary of State. And I expect that she'll continue it after she leaves um, her role at the State Department. Thoughts from Travels with Mrs. Bush? <laughs> Most incredible experience that um, I personally have, and all of us who traveled with Mrs. Bush um, got to see uh, just how important American leadership is uh, around the world and how by sending the first lady, uh, who's the closest you know, person um, to the president, how much that mattered and how that was welcomed not only by the individuals in the communities that you would meet, but also by the leaders of those countries and the relationships that the first ladies, the, the counterparts or e each other, that got to meet and work with each other. And some of that work you know, can still 
continue uh, when they're no longer in their official position. Um, but it, it, it is just an incredible opportunity, again, a short term uh, that they get to do something uh, like this, and um, they don't want to waste a minute of it. I think that was my, uh, my takeaway from that experience. Um, closing it, thoughts, Richard, was we're almost out of time on maybe the meaning of the First Lady, lady to the American people. Well, let me sort of add, okay. and actually it's a, a nice bridge, because um, I mentioned someone whose name we haven't mentioned, um, and who, uh, who, frankly, probably because she was so effacing, has never really, I think, gotten the recognition she deserves, and that's Pat Nixon. Mm -hmm. um, in 1970, there was a terrible earthquake in Peru, and Mrs. Nixon, I think, like so many Americans, uh, felt helpless in some ways, but um, she was in a position to do something to help, and she wanted to, and she went to her husband and said, I, I wanted, you know, and, and basically, eventually, they got a plane full of supplies from the American people, and Mrs. Nixon went with it on her own um, and went down there and went out into the stricken areas without a lot of photographers, without an entourage. She and the, uh, the wife of the, the president of Peru was very moving, um, and there are these wonderful photos. You know, she went to Africa um, and on an extensive diplomatic mission for the president, and there are these wonderful photos of her in native garb, dancing. In Liberia. Yeah, and she, frankly, she looks more comfortable mm -hmm. than she sometimes did on the campaign trail at home. And, and I remember when she died, the president said something to the effect that, you know, uh, people may not speak the same language, and they certainly don't speak the language of diplomacy, but they, they know love mm -hmm. when they see it. And in some ways, that brings us full circle from the, the, the social hostessing of Lady Washington. The role of diplomat, I think, is one that has been added in, and in a permanent way. Definitely. Definitely. Um, there's one other name, and we are out of time, but that hasn't come up, and that's Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. So uh, any thoughts on how she's put her you, impact? We're halfway through her legacy. I, but. You know, I, I, it's funny. I think she has walked the tightrope extraordinarily well. And when I say the tightrope, one thing that has happened as our first ladies have become more and more public property, uh, in part because of the media, they have higher approval ratings than their husbands in the polls. Their memoirs outsell their husbands <laughs> uh, 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 when, when time comes around. Um, and, and, and that's because they're not seen as partisan figures. That paradoxically makes them enormously valuable, great political assets to the administration. <laughs> right. And Mrs. Obama is a classic example. Right. She is well on her way to Eleanor-like status. She's a rock star, uh, and she managed, anyone watch that speech that she gave to the Democratic mm -hmm. Convention. She walks the tightrope mm -hmm. very skillfully. Right. I'm going to miss mention one thing because I know we're at the end, but in true bipartisan fashion, and we've covered the gamut of First Ladies, both Lisa and I, or Mark noted, are in, I'm in red, she's in blue. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to convey the spirit of bipartisanship in talking about First Ladies. They've all. Alita's in purple. <laughs> and Alita's independent in blue, purple. <laughs> No, it's been great. But it is, a, it is something that people, regardless of party, f can feel good about. And that is one of the many w wonderful legacies of our First Ladies. Absolutely. And with that, we really are, are out of time. Thank, Thank you, you all for this fascinating discussion about the legacy of First Ladies. Thank you, Thank you all.